Thank you for tuning into another video from JRM Recaps. Spoilers ahead. We back out of the webbing of neurons and synapses of a brain as the title credits show up, finding ourselves rising up out of a pore on the sweaty skin of the lead character, our narrator, as he peers down the barrel of a firearm that has been stuck in his mouth. The weapon is held by a man named Tyler who checks his watch, counting down to ground zero before he questions the narrator if he has anything to say. The narrator murmurs through the weapon before it's taken out of his mouth and says audibly that he can't come up with anything. As Tyler watches out the window of a very tall building to the dim city beneath them, the narrator remembers the way in which he met Tyler prior to halting himself and taking us to the start of the story. The narrator lets us know he hasn't slept for half a year. His occupation as an on-the-road product recall specialist for a car company doesn't help his inability to sleep due to traveling frequently, encountering episodes of jet lag and also ordinary pressure of his job, respecting the tiny life of single-serving shampoo and soap at each hotel. In the event that he can't sleep, he scrolls through the channels or looks at Fernie, a parody of IKEA, catalogs buying items of decor to add to his loft, he's an admitted slave of consumerism. He goes to his primary care physician looking for help, however all the specialist will do is propose a natural supplement rather than medications, and that he visits a support group for testicular cancer to witness genuine pain. There, the narrator meets Robert Bob Paulson, the big moosey in an ex-bodybuilder and steroid user who experiences an extremely bad case of gynecomastia because of hormone treatment after his balls were cut off. Bob is very ready to embrace the narrator with support by giving him a big hug. Stuck between Bob's huge breasts, the narrator at last discovers a sense of calm and begins sobbing uncontrollably. Having released his emotions he is finally able to sleep and consequently becomes dependent on support groups, outlining his week to go to various meetings and pretending he has that ailment. But, the presence of a lady named Marla Singer causes the narrator's system to haywire. He perceives her as a tourist, having seen her at numerous gatherings, including testicular cancer, and he is distraught by her lies to the degree that he can no longer sleep. After one of the meetings he approaches her. She contends that she's doing precisely the exact thing he does and jokes that the gatherings are less expensive than going to see a movie and there's free coffee. Rather than ratting each other out, they consent to split up the week and trade phone numbers. Regardless of his efforts, the narrator's sleep deprivation proceeds. On a trip back from one of his excursions for work, the narrator meets Tyler Durden. Tyler offers a distinctive viewpoint on crisis procedure manuals in the plane and they start up a casual discussion. Tyler is a soap sales rep whenever he's not pulling all-nighters as a projectionist and slipping pieces of pornography between reels. The narrator shows up at the baggage carousel to find that his bag has been seized, in all likelihood because of a secret of vibration, before he takes a taxi home. However, the home, a 15th-story condo, has been blown up into the night by what was estimated to be a defective gas line, lit by a spark from the fridge. Having no place to go, the narrator locates Tyler's business card and gives him a call. They meet in a parking area behind a bar where Tyler welcomes the narrator to ask to come live with him, on one condition, that the narrator hit Tyler as hard as possible. The narrator, however confused, consents and they take part in a fist fight prior to sharing a few beverages. The experience is shockingly euphoric and the narrator and Tyler return to his frail house where Tyler is obviously squatting. Tyler and the narrator participate in additional battles through the following days, and they before long draw the attention of other tough guys. Discovering their small fighting group getting bigger, Tyler lays out a formal fight club in the cellar of the bar where they had their very first fight. Participation rapidly grows in Tyler and the narrator design a list of rules, the initial two being you do not talk about fight club. The rules are frequently broken, with individuals welcoming their companions to go along with them. Consistently, Tyler demonstrates his wise, if irregular and corrupt, views on life. The narrator gets together with Marla by some coincidence, telling her that he hasn't gone to any meetings since he's joined another support group for only men. While he continues to treat her with mild disdain, it's clear he thinks about her with interest. At the point when she overdoses on Xanax, she calls the narrator who, sick of her babbling, puts the telephone down. 
He finds out later that Tyler picked up the telephone, followed the call to Marla's home, and took her back to the house where they participated in vigorous sexual relations, much to the narrator's distaste. The following morning in the kitchen, Marla finds the narrator, who is dumbfounded to see her in his home. The narrator's amazement insults her and she leaves in disdain. After she leaves, Tyler enters the kitchen and blissfully uncovers that he and Marla had intercourse the prior night. He additionally seriously makes the narrator guarantee that he won't ever mention Tyler to Marla. That evening the narrator joins Tyler while he takes human fat out of the dumpster of a liposuction facility. Tyler says that the best fat for making the soap he sells comes from humans. Back in their kitchen, Tyler tells the narrator the best way to deliver tallow from the fat. After explaining a bit about the history of soap making, Tyler plants a wet kiss on the rear of the narrator's hand and dumps pure lye on the spot, causing a terrible chemical burn. Tyler won't allow the narrator to wash the lye off, saying that water will make the burn worse, and lets the narrator know that the burn is a rite of passage. Tyler has burned his own hand in an identical fashion. Tyler additionally makes the narrator acknowledge loyalty to him and afterward neutralizes the burn with vinegar. Afterward, when they meet with a beauty care products sales rep at a department chain, the narrator comments that Tyler's soap sells at an extremely significant price. With the narrator, he holds a university dropout at gunpoint and threatens to end his life in the event that he doesn't pursue his dream about turning into a veterinarian. He permits Lou, the owner of the bar where their fight club is held, to pummel him prior to spewing blood all over him and demanding to remain in the cellar. Scared, Lou agrees. Tyler gives the club members a schoolwork task, they will all provoke a total outsider to fight and lose. The narrator says it's a lot harder of an assignment than anybody would suspect. Bob confronts individuals in a midtown square while another member threatens a minister. After a few days, Marla leaves and Tyler acquaints the narrator with his most current hobby. Utilizing his excellent abilities in soap making, Tyler has transformed the cellar of the house into a lab where he uses soap and different ingredients to make explosives. Tyler and the narrator keep overseeing Fight Club, however this time, at a vastly different regularity. Getting flack at work, the narrator at last approaches his supervisor with information about inadequate practice and haggles to work from home with a pay raise to keep his mouth shut. At the point when his supervisor objects and calls security, the narrator beats himself up so badly that, when security shows up, they are deceived to think that the narrator's supervisor attacked his worker. Tyler then gives homework assignments to his new enlistees and teaches them about the burdens of consumerism and relying on society and authority figures. He proposes to return to the time where a man's worth was based upon the sweat on his back and where he uses only what is needed. This way of thinking develops into what Tyler calls Project Mayhem, and the fighting in cellars transforms into devilish destructive incidents and vandalism. Their actions are not ignored, however Tyler figures out how to show the lead agent that the very individuals he's hunting are those that they rely upon, servers, transport drivers, sewer architects, and more. They threaten the police chief with castration and the investigation is cancelled. The haggard house where Tyler and the narrator reside transforms into Mayhem Central, where each newcomer is put through a meticulous period of initiation and training, where the newest plans are created. While Project Mayhem develops, the narrator starts to feel increasingly more distant from Tyler and jealousy sets in, making him venture to such an extreme as to beat up and deform one newcomer on the grounds that he wanted to destroy something beautiful. As they leave this fight club meeting, Tyler drives the narrator and two others in a big Lincoln Town car. In a downpour, Tyler insults the narrator, inferring that he hasn't even started to carry on with his life to his fullest potential. At the point when he permits the vehicle to drift into oncoming traffic, Tyler scolds the narrator for being pathetic and weak. Tyler then concedes that he ruined the narrator's loft. The narrator at last yields, Tyler allows the vehicle to drift even more and they hit head-on into another vehicle. They come out of the crash with Tyler shouting that the narrator has a new view on life due to him experiencing a near-death situation. At the point when Tyler vanishes for some time, the narrator is left at home with an ever-expanding band of Mayhem members who sit in front of the TV and laugh at their publicized destructive incidents. 
When the narrator commands to learn more about their vandalism, Bob tells him the first rule of Project Mayhem is you do not ask questions. Later Bob is killed during a mismanaged vandalism operation and the narrator looks to disband the group before things become out of control. He attempts to find Tyler and finds a rundown of telephone numbers he recently used. The narrator follows the list all around the nation, finding that fight clubs are now everywhere. At one specific bar, the barkeep calls the narrator sir which prompts the narrator to inquire as to whether he knows him. The barkeep, in the wake of being guaranteed that he's not being put through a test, lets the narrator know that he is Tyler Durden. In shock, the narrator gets back to his lodging and calls up Marla, inquiring as to whether they've at any point engaged in sexual relations. However aggravated, Marla affirms their relationship and states that she knows him as Tyler Durden. Marla hangs up and Tyler abruptly shows up in the room and approaches the narrator, letting him know he broke his guarantee to not talk about Tyler to Marla. A couple of minutes of discussion affirms that they are, in fact, one individual. The narrator has a sleeping disorder and can't sleep, so whenever he thinks he's sleeping, Tyler's persona takes over. The revelation makes the narrator faint. At the point when he awakens, he finds one more telephone list alongside him with calls from everywhere over the country. He gets back to an empty home and finds a bulletin board with folders specifying specific structures within the financial district. He observes that everyone has been infiltrated by individuals from Project Mayhem and that Tyler is planning on annihilating them, therefore destroying credit card organization records and wiping the slate clean. In a frenzy, the narrator snatches all the data and reports himself to the police. But, in the wake of telling the investigator all that he knows and being left with two policemen, the narrator finds that the officials are Mayhem members and they let him know that they were told by him to take the balls of anybody who obstructed Project Mayhem, even him. The narrator figures out how to escape by taking one of the policemen's guns and hurries to one of the structures set for demolition. He finds a van in the parking structure loaded up with dynamite and tries to disarm the bomb. Tyler shows up and provokes him but the narrator is successful in disarming the bomb. He and Tyler participate in a ferocious battle which shows up strangely on the surveillance cameras since the narrator is just fighting himself. The Tyler personality wins and reactivates the bomb and the narrator carries himself to another structure where they can safely watch the destruction. Back at the opening scene, the narrator, with the firearm in his mouth, mutters once more and tells Tyler, I still can't think of anything. Tyler grins and says, ah, flashback humor. The narrator asks that Tyler leave the project yet Tyler is determined. He declares that what he's doing is saving humankind from the enslavement of consumerism and pointless luxuries and that there won't actually need to be any casualties, the individuals who work in the structures are all Mayhem members, totally mindful of the scheme. Close to his limit, the narrator comes to understand that anything Tyler does, he can do. He sees Tyler with the firearm in his grasp and understands that it's actually in his grasp. He puts it up to his own chin and advises Tyler to pay attention to him. He says that his eyes are open and afterward places the weapon in his mouth and pulls the trigger. The bullet shoots out of the side of his jaw and Tyler is killed with a large wound to the rear of his head. As the narrator recuperates, individuals from Project Mayhem show up with snacks and Marla with them. Tyler had previously instructed her to be brought by them. Seeing the injuries Tyler sustained, the Mayhem members leave Marla by herself with him to bring a few medical supplies. Tyler remains with Marla and advises her that everything will be fine as the first explosion goes off in the structure in front of them. The others on the block before long go off with the same pattern and Tyler clasps Marla's hand with his and tells her you met me at a very strange time in my life. They watch as the explosives go off and the buildings collapse. Thank you for watching our recap. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for future videos. Also, try some of our other videos displayed on screen.